Good evening, and welcome to Pasadena City College. We have an opportunity to listen to one of the most famous psychologists of the 20th and the 21st centuries. When we speak of literature, I mean, uh, there are many names that come to your mind. When you speak of physics, when you speak of any subject matter, there's a distinct name that comes to your mind. But when we speak of psychology, when we speak of the transformational work that has taken place in that field, there is one name that stands out. That's Dr. Zimbardo that we have the pleasure of welcoming here today. In the 1970s, many of you would know, for about nine days, Dr. Zimbardo was known as Superintendent Zimbardo. In the famous prison experiment, and I'm pretty sure Dr. Zimbardo will mention something about that today. I myself, in the 1990s, I was teaching psychology at Temple University and Long Island University. And I told Dr. Zimbardo today that I bought the whole collection of VHS tapes that he had made about psychology. And I would use them to teach psychology, introductory, uh, what is it, Psychology 101. In any field of study, it is important that we master that field, that we understand it, that we become innovative and creative. Dr. Zimbardo will do that for us today. And let us give him a Lancer welcome to Pasadena City College. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Zimbardo. So I'm gonna talk about evil what makes good people go wrong. Uh, and this is something that uh, theologians have talked about, philosophers, uh, as part of our, our literature. Uh, and I started asking that question when I was six years old. I grew up in the South Bronx in a ghetto in New York City, facing poverty and also prejudice. Uh, my family was Sicilian, migrated from, from Sicily, poor, laborers, uneducated. Uh, and if you grow up in, in any ghetto, and this is a picture of the South Bronx. It's not a third world country. Um, <clears throat> and this is our playground. We used to play here. Uh, they used to shut the, the, the schoolyard on the weekend. We'd have to climb up that fence to get in to play softball or stickball or whatever. So poverty is a systemic evil. I'm going to talk about different kinds of evil. Dispositional evil, situational evil, and systemic evil uh, in a minute. So it's a systemic evil. Growing up in any inner city anywhere in the world, there are men whose job it is to corrupt kids to do bad things for money, to, 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 to break into stores at night, uh, to take uh, narcotics from one place to another place, get girls to sell their body for money. <clears throat> and the problem was I had friends who were really good kids who gave into the temptation, and I and some other friends did not. So as a kid, a little kid, I'm asking a basic psychological question. What's the difference between kids who give into temptation and somehow kids who resist? Well, it wasn't until I got to be a psychologist many years later that I began to have answers to that question. On the other hand, poverty now is actually increasing in the United States. Last year, it was 21% 20, of all children in America are growing up below the poverty level. And this is now, this is in America, this is true of many third world countries, but it's true in our own country. So my personal experience is, uh, so again, one of the other things about growing up in a ghetto in, pop, in, a, is you, in those days, it was a very toxic environment, meaning um, there was uh, asbestos everywhere, lead paint on the walls, uh, the streets were filthy, often were not clean. And uh, I'm talking about 1938, 39, a long, long time before most of you were alive. And um, con contagious diseases were rampant. Uh, and I got double pneumonia, which is not a contagious disease, but I got whooping cough. And in those days, all poor children who had any contagious disease, polio, tuberculosis, scarlet fever, et cetera, et cetera, were sent to a hospital in, 
in, in um, Manhattan called the Willard Parker Hospital for Children with Contagious Diseases. And I can remember, I closed my eyes, a huge ward with hundreds and hundreds of beds, kids, little kids from age two up to, I guess, 16, 17, um, all with contagious diseases, and crying, coughing. And it's 1938. There are no penicillin. There's no sulfur drugs, meaning there's no treatment, meaning kids died all the time. So it was really like genetic roulette. Whether you lived or died, had, there was no treatment. You just lie in bed all the time. And I decided I didn't want to die. That didn't seem to be a good, a good way to live my life. So I just resolved. I'm not going to die. I'm going to live. I'm going to live forever. I'm going to I'm, make myself eternal. And I'm, I'm keeping up with that. Uh, but in any event, I survived. I was in the hospital for six months. And one day, the nurse came and said, you're ready to go home. I said, really? She said, yeah. You know, I said, I don't feel any better. I mean, but you know, the problem is you have a double pneumonia and whooping cough. You can't eat because you're always coughing up. So I was really, really skinny. In fact, my, my, I can remember I had a lovely aunt who called me Philip, the bag of bones. So I go home to the Bronx, 1005 East 151st Street. I moved in a new place in the ghetto, a different part of the ghetto. And I'm so excited to finally have friends. So I go out, I walk down, I'm really skinny. Uh, and I'm, I'm waving to kids. They start chasing, yelling, screaming out, dirty Jewish. I, I'm, clearly, this is an angry group, so I'm running away and running and running and running. I run home, come out the next day, same thing. They yell, dirty your best, dirty your best. And finally, I didn't want to go out anymore. Uh, they were yelling, dirty Jew bastard. I'm six years old, and these kids are about the same age. And the problem was I was really skinny. I had blue eyes and a big nose. And that was the image of Jews, because these kids were Italian, they were Spanish, uh, mixed, Irish, a lot of uh, Irish kids, German kids. Uh, and it wasn't until, I guess, a week or so later, my mother asked the janitor's son, Charlie Glassford, African-American kid, black kid, to take me to church. He said, he can't go to church, he's a Jew. I said, no, we're, we're Italian, we're Catholic. He said, oh my God, we've been beating him up because he's a Jew, now we made a big mistake. <laughs> so, so then I got accepted. So that was my first experience. Uh, and then... Um, I went to North Hollywood High School for one year uh, in 1947. And, I come, and so I, was, uh, I had determined, um, being a, a sickly kid, that there were two things you had to do if you were a boy. You had, to, you had to learn sports. So I really practiced and practiced. And I got really good. I was really good stickball player, a softball player. <clears throat> and for all that running, I was actually a track athlete. <clears throat> and, uh, and so I get, the, and, I, and then the other thing is, it's important to be popular. So I, I worked at, I always looked at kids. How come this kid is a leader? How come this kid is a follower? So I really studied <clears throat> what did kids do so that other kids voted for them to be class president or captain of the team, and I simply modeled it. So I was captain of everything, president of everything. And I get to North Hollywood High School, and I've got this big smile and a grin. I'm ready to greet everybody. And I be, kids are shunning me. What does that mean? means when I sat down in class, nobody would sit next to me. When I went to the cafeteria, hi, how are you? Nobody would sit next to me. And they wouldn't explain why, and I didn't understand. I mean, here I'm one of the really popular kids, now I'm shunned. And this went on and on and on, and finally I just gave up. I actually developed psychosomatic uh, asthma, meaning I got sick at night, I couldn't sleep. It was a reason I couldn't go to school very often. Uh, and it wasn't until the spring, April, <clears throat> I made the baseball team, and we're going to some game. I, I think we're going to Van Nuys or someplace. And I asked some kid, I said, you know, how, why, why don't kids like you, like me? He said, no, it's not about liking, we're afraid of you. Again, I'm still skinny, maybe I'm 150 pounds now, and I'm this size. I said, what do you mean afraid? Well, we all know you're from New York and you're Sicilian. We think you're part of the mafia, your family. <laughs> I said, that's, but it was too late. I mean, I, I couldn't undo the thing. So, so that was being discriminated against because of Sicilian. Even worse, <clears throat> I now um, graduate from, I'm graduating from Brooklyn College. It's now 1954, um, and I apply to Yale, um, where it was my first choice, and um, I don't get in, but I don't get out. 
I get into a lot of other schools, but Yale was my favorite. It was nearby New York, and it was Yale University. Uh, it was the Ivory League, my mother used to say. It's the Ivory League. And um, so I'm about to go to uh, University of Minnesota to work with Stanley Schachter. He gave me a, a fellowship. And I get a call from somebody who says, hi, I'm Kay Montgomery. Uh, I'm a professor at Yale University. Uh, uh, we're interested in your application. I said, really? I never, got, I never got a letter of acceptance or rejection. I was put on the question list. He said, have you made a decision yet? I said, yeah, I'm probably going to go to Minnesota. He said, uh, wait, and this was like April 14th, 15th, as you know, is the deadline. He said, uh, uh, the Eastern Psychological Association is meeting in New York. Uh, tomorrow, I'll meet you at the New Yorker Hotel, 10 o'clock. Uh, I want to ask you some questions. So I go there at 10 o'clock. He's already had two martinis. In those days, psychology used to drink a lot. He said, I want to ask you three questions. One, um, uh, do you know how to run rats? I said, yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, we had rats in our apartment. We know we had to get rid of them. <laughs> uh, do you know how to build equipment? I said, yeah, my father. Could. I didn't tell him. My father could do anything. He said, um, uh, can you start working at Yale this summer? I said, what do you mean? He said, I can offer you an assistantship at I don't know, $1,700 a year uh, uh, working in my lab. And I said, sure. OK, you're accepted. That was my acceptance. Wow, that's incredible. Um, and, and then I get there. And I'm running rats in the lab. And it turned out, to make a long story short, that um, uh, he had a research grant. K. Montgomery, he was one of the first people to do research on exploratory behavior, curiosity behavior, which is novel in those days. And he had made, he had made a, um, an offer to Gordon Bauer, who, turned them, who was going to go and then the last minute uh, decided to go someplace else. So he was stuck. He had assistantship. And everybody else on the list was accepted or rejected. And I was the question mark. So, so I got in. And it turned out one of the reasons I was questionable is that half of the faculty had assumed that I was black, black, mulatto. And because I was black, my letters of recommendation were probably exaggerated. And because I was black, uh, I probably would not succeed. And they, they didn't want me to, to be a failure because it would be a disgrace to them, because they never had a black graduate student in the history of the Yale psychology department. <clears throat> I found this out later. Um, and so I was put on the questionable uh, pile, not accept, not reject. And I only found this out m many years later. And I said, what do you mean black? And they said, well, the faculty was divided. Half of them believed you were and said, we shouldn't take you because you're going to fail and, and be disgraced. And others said, we should take you because we never had one. OK? We'll, we'll see if you could do it. I said, well, why did they think I was black? Well, um, first of all, in those days, you had to send a picture it precisely to, so they could see what your race is. Well, I didn't have any money, so <clears throat> uh, you, I was applying to a lot of schools. And on the back of a comic book, you could get 10 pictures for a dollar or something like in those days. So the pictures I had were very grainy and dark. So I looked darker than the, the others. <clears throat> and then, um, let's see, that's the one thing. And then the second thing was um, I had done research as an undergraduate. I published research on the dynamics of prejudice between Puerto Ricans and blacks in the Bronx and published it. So I was interested in blacks and Puerto Ricans. Um, and then it went on and on. You know, and they said, uh, what favorite music, jazz, <clears throat> um, athlete, I'm, I'm a track runner, um, uh, 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 a favorite reading, Downbeat magazine. So it all, it all fit. Now, I had a little mustache, and in those days, somebody called a Billy Eckstein collar and shirt. So I was clearly black for some of them. And again, there was this debate. Should we take him? Should we not take him? Uh, and they took me, and obviously, I, I did well. I actually published... As, as a graduate student, I published five or six articles, including an article in Science, where I was a senior, senior uh, um, um, author. Uh, so, so, so at the end, they said, well, we're glad we didn't make a mistake. Um, and, then, uh, and then I graduate. I graduate Yale, and I'm coming to New York. I got a job at New York University. Uh, and we're moving in. I remember it's really hot in the summer. And uh, my brother and I were... We, we had rented a U-Haul, and we had a, like, it was sweating. We had put a, a bandana around our head. And as we're walking, carrying stuff in, 
Two ladies pass by and they say, oh my God, the Puerto Ricans are moving in. That's the end of this neighborhood. So Jew, Sicilian, black, Puerto Rican. So I understand what prejudice is and how it can hurt. Uh, so the other thing that had a big influence on me was as a little kid reading about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Robert Louis Stevenson's famous story. And if you remember that story, and there's a good, a good movie about it, the good Dr. Jekyll, in, in those days, all doctors were always scientists working in a basement someplace, like Dr. Frankenstein, uh, invented a chemical that he thought would make people strong and healthy. In fact, when he took it, you know, they didn't have human subjectivity, so he was his own subject. It did the opposite. He became crazed, he became a killer. And when the drug wore off, he went back across the line between good and evil and got to be the good Dr. Jekyll. And he couldn't resist taking it one more time and again. But for me, my friends wanted to know what was in the juice. They wanted to try it. I was interested actually in the line between good and evil because the nuns in Catholic school said, you know, there is this line, almost like a divine line, that bad people like them were there and good people like us were here. And the line was impermeable, which means that if you're on the good side, whew, you don't have to worry. And if you're on the bad side, you're, you're unreconstructed. But the story forced me to think about the line is, could be permeable. That good people, like Dr. Jekyll, could be lured across for some reason, and maybe bad people can be rescued. So it be, I began to think about what are the kinds of things that could make that line not impermeable, but permeable. And it had a big, big in, uh, impact on my thinking, even as a little kid. So again, there are many definitions of evil. I think we said before, philosophical, literary. The psychological definition has to do with power, for me. It's the exercise of power to intentionally harm people psychologically. Again, through prejudice, uh, uh, through um, uh, discrimination, uh, uh, hurt physically through discrimination, through bullying. To kill people mortally. But most crime is not done by individuals, it's done by nations. And that's commit crimes against humanity. And one of the things we have not focused very much on, which we should have since the 2008 disaster, is crimes in corporation. Again, that's systemic crime. It's allowing fraud, corruption, uh, bullying, and bullying is a big problem in, in, uh, in corporations, uh, indifference, and what's known as willful blindness. So when evil is done by individuals, we tend to think of them as bad apples, that it's something is in them. But then we want to know the situation is, what is the bad barrel that somebody put a good apple in to corrupt him or her? And then we want to know who makes the barrel. So at a systemic level, these are the uh, organizational influences, political, economic. These are the bad barrel makers. So one of, the, one of my contributions is to say, that we really have to understand not only evil, but everything at these, this tripartite level. What is it that individuals bring into any situation? What is it that the situation brings out of people? And that's the main thing I'm going to talk about today. And then what is the, the overarching or underlying structure, the system, that, uh, that, uh, in which these situations uh, operate? Now, the question of what makes, uh, and there was a whole uh, article in uh, Time magazine, what makes us good versus evil, we now know from lots and lots of research about uh, what makes ordinary people turn evil. Dehumanization means thinking of others as less than human. The Nazis were masters at creating images of Jews as vermin. They had whole movies about this. Uh, diffusion of responsibility. Uh, we had a wonderful... Uh, training session this afternoon with, with many of you in which we talked about why is it people don't help others in need? Well, the problem is when you go into a situation and somebody is hurt and other people pass by, the norm is do nothing. So that ordinarily, if you were alone, you feel personally responsible to helping. Now your, your, your sense of responsibility gets diffused and you do nothing. Obedience to authority, we're gonna talk about Stanley Milgram's famous research that often we are trained as children to be obedient to authority, to our parents, to ministers, to rabbis, priests, teachers, politicians. The problem is nobody teaches us the distinction between authorities that deserve our respect and authorities that deserve our defiance. Nowhere in our system, nowhere in any system that I know in the world, do people make that distinction, teaching kids, 
Yes, you know, authorities can be just or authorities can be unjust, including parents, including teachers. Now, we know from the recent scandal of Catholic priests around the world who were sexually abusing children, thousands of children for many, many, many years, children who were blindly obedient to respecting uh, priests. If you're a little Catholic kid, and it's not only in Irish countries, but in America as well. Group pressure. We are, we are social animals. Although we like to think of ourselves as individuals, we live in groups. Group shape, group norms shape our behavior. Uh, I always tell kids, you know, you, lo you look at old movies, and um, when you think... When you think of yourself as, you know, the way I'm dressed, the kind of music I like, the way I carry my books is my choice. Not at all. Everybody 20 years ago dressed differently. Nobody, nobody in my generation would imagine wearing uh, jeans with, uh, with shredded knees or shredded things. That some, some of the students, I still, still do that. Uh, the kind of music you listen to. Uh, 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 if, if you look at any pictures of baseball games before the Second World War, every man at a baseball game was wearing a fedora. Every man wore a hat all the time. That was, that was the way you dressed. Women went out, they had pocketbooks and gloves. Uh, that's all changed. So we are part of what we think is our taste is really reflecting the groups we are in. And lastly, anonymity. Uh, anonymity, and we, I, I, we call it de-individuation. So we see this every year at Carnival, at Mardi Gras. That is, we wear masks that allow us to step out of our usual uh, orientation, and for one night, that's what it means at Mardi Gras, uh, you, you can allow libidinal urges to surface. Uh, the problem is that um, we, can wear, we can be anonymous without wearing a mask. In many cases, we see the Ku Klux Klan for many years uh, wore the hoods. And we, I did research to show that women made to feel anonymous when given the opportunity to deliver electric shock to other women gave twice as much when they were in hoods than when they were uh, uh, um, individuated, when they were not in hoods. Now I'm going to start with systemic evil and then move to situational evil. Are there any Chinese students here? OK, not many. So I'm going to tell you something, and the question is, what are you going to do with this knowledge? Your government, every year, kills one million Chinese men and it's going to get worse. Kills. How do they do it? They encourage Chinese men, but not Chinese women, to smoke. 54% of all Chinese men smoke two or three packs of cigarettes a day. Okay? And why do they do it? They own the tobacco monopoly. They make 605 billion yen a year. Okay? The government, because they control the media, they prevent anti-smoking campaigns. So they got it coming and going. What do they do with the money? They do good things. They, they, they create schools. Here in Sichuan province in China is the Sichuan Primary Tobacco School. That's the name of it. And if you could read the sign, it says, ingenuity is the fruit of diligence. Tobacco will help you succeed. Little kids going to that school are being brainwashed, saying tobacco is good for you. Now, there was an article recently in Lancet magazine, the science magazine, which says it's going to get worse. Chinese men smoke one-third of the world's cigarettes. Okay? Chinese women smoke far less, only less than 2%. It's the biggest gender gap in the world. Less than 2% of women and 54% and of men. Uh, in most other countries, it's, it's on the order of 20% men, uh, about that same for women. And what they say is 20% of all Chinese men will die of smoking in this decade. By 2030, 2 million will die, and by 2050, 3 million will die every year. We get upset at a terrorist attack in Paris. 50 people die, a little thing in, in Scandinavia. It's, we're talking about millions. And I was in China recently. I presented this, uh, and nobody reacted. So I'm saying, here's evidence that if, if, if you were Chinese, you have to say, you should be doing something about this. Because this is, for me, the, the worst example of systemic evil I, I can imagine. War, genocide, as I said, poverty and prejudice are evil. The other two evils, again, that we take for granted are sex lab uh, slave labor and sex trafficking. 
Slave labor means, uh, in many countries throughout the world, individuals and sometimes whole families work enormous number of hours for, for almost no pay at subsistence uh, levels, uh, and you're almost like an indentured servant. Sex trafficking is now the most profitable business in the world. There are estimates by the UN of somewhere between 600,000 and a million sex workers. Women and children in every, every single country, including our own, who are um, lured in various ways in, into prostitution. Uh, and to keep them alive, uh, their, their pimps only have to pay $2,000 a year, just bare subsistence. And each one makes $35,000 profit. You add that up, it's the most profitable business. So many of the drug traffickers have gone into sex trafficking because it's not prosecuted the way drug trafficking is. So he has this horrible crime which is spreading and is not really uh, prosecuted. Only recently in many airports there are signs about sex trafficking, but it's not clear what, what you do with, with uh, the information. Now these are all evils of action. The other kind of evil is the evil of inaction meaning not doing anything about climate change, indifference to climate change. And there's been a big debate in our country, and apparently our new, our new president believes that, again, it's a hoax, it doesn't really exist. Um, around the world, the climate has changed in the, last, in the last few years, more extreme and more unpredictable than ever before. Places that used to have drought are now having rainstorms, places that used to have a, a lot of um, rain are now having drought. Uh, we have unprecedented amount of snowfall in some places. Uh, uh, we've, it's been the hottest year on record for the last several years. I mean, in more than 100 years throughout the world. Uh, uh, I was in um, uh, Fiji Islands recently, and on a cruise, <clears throat> And the cruise master said, this island, this island, this island, that island, this one, in five years will disappear. The water is rising several inches a year, and the farms, the houses, everything will disappear. And we know that. And the French government is doing nothing about it to relocate these people. There's nothing you can do to stop the water from rising. But it's going to be true in many other places, within San Francisco, many places that are harvests. So I want to switch now very quickly to situational evil. A little Jewish kid in the Bronx asked these two questions. Would you electrocute a stranger if someone like Hitler asked you to? And could the Holocaust happen again in the United States? This little kid was Stanley Milgram. And he asked these questions in 1962, but he was thinking about that much earlier. And he, was, he did the research which really quantified evil in terms of what is the percentage of people, ordinary American citizens, who would deliver maximum electric shock to an innocent stranger when they had the opportunity to stop at any point along the way. Because an authority told you to do it. So here's now, here's our obedience to unjust authority. Milgram described his experiment to 40 psychiatrists at the Yale Medical School. He was at Yale, he just got there. He was a beginning assistant professor when he did this research. And essentially in his study, as you know, people are recruited with an ad in the New Haven Register. New Haven is where Yale is. Wanted uh, men ages 20 to 50, no college students, no high school students, for a study of memory. And what he says is, we will give you $4 for one hour. And what we really want to know is, um, we know that memory can be improved by rewarding correct answers. We're interested in whether memory can be improved by punishing errors. So we want to we do that kind of research. Sounds good. So he's saying, we want to do something good. We want you to help somebody else improve memory. So you come down, you answer the ad, you come down to his laboratory, and, um, and there's another guy there, and he says, one of you will be the teacher, one of you will be the learner. The teacher will give the learner material to learn. When he gets it right, you say good. When he gets it wrong, you give him electric shock. And in front of you is a big shock generator starting with 15 volts. And, it, and it, there's 30 switches increasing by 15 volts, 15, 30, et cetera. And at the end, you look down. It's like 300, 350, 450. Uh, but you can't imagine, nothing, you never imagine going there. 
And so, so now you begin, and, and the guy that's giving you the instructions is wearing a white lab coat. He's actually a bi high school biology teacher, but he's Milgram's assistant. Uh, and, and so, and the question is, what percent of American, American citizens would go all the way to 450 volts? These psychiatrists said only 1%. To do so would be, only psychopaths would do that. So again, that's the base. They say 1%. The question is, what is, what is the data? I should mention before we go on that little Stanley Milgram and I were in the same class at James Monroe High School in the Bronx. So that's me in the middle, and that's little Stanley down there. Uh, he was the smartest kid in the class, uh, uh, but the least popular. Uh, <laughs> and uh, only because he was so smart, he was so arrogant. Uh, sadly, he died at age 50 um, from multiple, multiple heart attacks. Uh, and here we are. This is senior class, 1949. Um, so Milgram wanted to be a filmmaker, and he did. His movie, Obedience, done in 1962, was the first movie made in psychology about research. And because you could see the, the people suffering in the study, the, the guilt that they were feeling, he got a lot of flack about the ethics of that research. So, but later on, he talked about why he did the study. So I'd like you to listen to the moral reason why he did this immoral study. When I learn of incidents such as the massacre of millions of men, women, and children perpetrated by the Nazis in World War II, how is it possible, I ask myself, that ordinary people who are courteous and decent in everyday life can act callously, inhumanely, without any limitations of conscience? Now, there are some studies in my discipline, social psychology, that seem to provide a clue to this question. I the problem I wanted to study was a little different, it went a little bit further. It was the issue of authority. Under what conditions would a person obey authority who commanded actions that went against conscience? Under what conditions would an individual obey authority when the authority gave you a command that went against your conscience, against your morals, against your values? And that's what he did the research on. Uh, and if you remember, uh, the learner gets strapped. So these are middle-aged guys. The learner is actually a confederate of Milgram, but you don't know that. You're, you're going to be the teacher, he's going to be the learner. And you help strap him into an electric chair, but he's going to be in another room in one study, so you, in one version. So you don't actually see him, you hear him, and you talk to him over the intercom. Uh, and then there you are in front of the shock apparatus with the 30 switches, uh, and there's the, the uh, authority in the lab coat saying, let's begin. You give him information, he gets it right, you say fine. You give him information, he gets it wrong, you press 15 volts, nothing happens. Then you press 30 volts, then you press 45. When you get to 100, the guy starts screaming. When he gets higher, he says, wait, I quit. Uh, I have a heart condition, I don't want to go on. And in every case, every individual turns to the experiment and says, sir, I don't think we should go on. Uh, he's, he's suffering. The experiment says, I'm sorry, you don't understand. You have a contract. You just got $4. You must continue. And it goes on and on, the guy's screaming more and more, and people keep verbally dissenting. Sir, I don't think, and they can, oh, almost always, if you hear, the, um, if you hear the, the, um, the video, uh, the audio, sir, and it goes, I'm sorry, you must continue. Do you not understand? When it gets up to 300 volts, there's a scream, a thud, and silence. And you say, are you okay in there? You don't hear anything. Experiment says, you must continue. He says, sir, he's not responding. I mean, how could, how could he be making an error or not? He's not responding. Experiment says, errors of omission are the same of errors of commission. You must continue. Okay. At that point, you're an adult. You're 20 to 50 years old. It doesn't make sense. How could you be helping improve his memory if, if he's unconscious or dead? You can't, okay, obviously. And at that point, everybody should drop out. The interesting thing, if you get to 300 volts, nobody drops out. Everybody goes to 450 volts. How many? Two thirds, not 1%, two of every three people, 65% of all the people in that study went all the way. Now, Milgram tested 1,000 people. Now, obviously, what he did is different experimental variations. He didn't put them all in one study. Uh, so, um, so, this is, I, I think he did 19 variations. I, I made this graph with 16. 
so in fact, although almost all the research was with men, in study 16, he has women as participants. In study 16, oh no, in study 13, I'm sorry, women no different than men. For me, the most interesting thing is the comparison of study 16 with study 5. In study 16, you come in, the experiment says, I'm sorry we're running a little late. Please have a seat and watch, yeah, please have a seat and you can see the, the experiment, experiment finishing up. Same thing in study five. We're running a little late. And in one case, what you see is somebody like you go all the way to 450 volts. Now it's your turn. What happens there in study 16, obedience goes up to 91%. What happens when you see people rebel? In study number five, it goes down to 5%, 10%. So what does this mean? It means that we are powerful models. When people observe our behavior, when we do good, when we do a heroic deed, we, there's a ripple effect in a positive way. When we do bad things, when we do evil, uh, uh, when you cross the street against a red light, whatever it is, when people see you stealing or cheating, you, you create a negative ripple effect. So for me, this is one of the most, posit one of the most important things from Milgram's study that nobody talks about, is that the impact that our behavior has without our awareness of people who observe us uh, doing these. I want to argue that all evil begins with 15 volts. That once you press that first button, even though the guy is not responding, you're on the slippery slope of evil. You see, that, you see where it's going. So when you press 15, you know next is 30, and then you see down, down the other end. So the Nazis knew this. Whoops. So what I did is I created <laughs> a Nazi shock box. So 15 volts, is, Jews had to wear a yellow bed, Star of David. 75, restricted work, restricted housing, no schooling for Jewish children, Jewish children of vermin, forced into ghettos, sent to concentration camps, and then finally, the final solution, six million Jews are exterminated. So again, you imagine the same phenomena that Milgram was talking about was, is a gradual, a gradual slippery slope. Uh, initially, when Jews had to wear a star, they thought, well, you know, it's no problem. We just stand out. Anything that makes you stand out from everybody else, there's a reason that you're going to be identified as different from us. You're going to be identified as uh, different in a different group that the rest of us perceive you as less than human, and therefore we can do all these terrible things to you. Now, a classic another classic situation of situational evil that I created, the Stanford Prison Study, uh, as my host uh, mentioned, uh, that I did way back in 1971. Uh, see, my, my concern was that it's really rare that somebody tell, in authority tells you to do bad shit. Usually, you're playing a role. You have a job. You're in a situation, you look around, other people are doing this thing. And so I wanted to create institutional evil. I want to create a thing where nobody tells you anything specific to do, but in that, there's something about the situation impels you, compels you, pushes you in that, that direction. Uh, so um, we put an ad in the, the um, um, Palo Alto newspaper, wanted college students, I wanted bright kids, college students for study of prison life could go up to two weeks uh, 75 people answered the ad. We gave them personality tests, a battery of uh, six personality tests uh, from uh, UCLA, clinical interviews, and then we picked two dozen, most normal, most healthy, and then we randomly assigned them, have to be guards, have to be prisoners. So there's no difference at the beginning of the study who's going to be a guard, who's going to be a prisoner. And of course, it's 1971, nobody liked cops, nobody likes prison guards. Uh, students are anti-military, anti anti-authority, but some of them had to play the role of guard. And so at the beginning, on the first day, I was going to end it because the, guard, the guards would say, come on, you guys, take it seriously. You know, no laughing. Said, oh, nothing's happening. And on the morning of the second day, the prisoners rebelled. They didn't want to be dehumanized. What does that mean? Prisoners had to wear these, these smocks, and they, they, the guards, we took away their name and gave them numbers, as in a real prison. That was dehumanization. We took away their identity. You're just a number, OK? Uh, the, 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 I, they, that was their IDs. So they rebelled, and the, the, the guards 
uh, crushed the rebellion physically, uh, and at that point, the guard said, these are dangerous prisoners, and we have to show them who's boss, and we have to demonstrate that we have power and they have none. And so each day thereafter, the guards in various ways had to demonstrate their power. Guards worked eight-hour shifts. There were three guards on each shift. Prisoners lived three, three prisoners to a cell, and there were three prisoners in each cell, and then there were standby guards and standby prisoners. So the guards had these military uniforms, symbols of power, and as I said at the beginning, they were menial tasks. But then when the, after the prisoners uh, rebelled, the guards started uh, escalating their, their, their sadism, stripping the prisoners naked, uh, having them engage in um, really despicable, sexually degrading uh, activities. In 1971, Phil Zimbardo conducted a revolutionary experiment here in the bowels of Stanford University in the United States. It brought the world of psychology. A group of students were divided randomly into prisoners and guards and lived in a makeshift jail. The prisoners immediately became submissive and the guards became cruel. Within a week, Phil Zimbardo's prison was inhumane and the experiment had to be cut short. In 36 hours, the first prisoner who was arrested, I should mention that to make it realistic, I had the Palo Alto Police Department do the arrest. A squad car came to where each of the kids who were going to be prisoners uh, were staying, uh, brought, arrested them, brought them to the real pl uh, jail, uh, put them in a real prison cell, and then my, uh, put a, um, uh, a um, mask uh, uh, over their eyes and then brought them to our, our prison. Uh, so that, essentially, the authorities had taken away your freedom, and the only way you get your freedom back is by going to parole board. And we had parole boards, we had parents visiting. We made it as realistic as possible. We had prison chaplains come down. Uh, and the first kid to get arrested, 8612, Doug Corpy, broke down in 36 hours. How could that be? It's a study. Everybody knows the experiment. They sign informed consent. So we didn't believe it. We thought maybe he's faking. But then what happened is each day thereafter, another prisoner had an emotional breakdown, screaming out of control. Uh, and so we had to end the study. I'll tell you later the person, the heroic person who forced me to end the study. <clears throat> so here's the worst guard in the study was a young kid, um, <clears throat> an 18-year-old freshman from Chapman College down here. And after the first day, he said, this is not working. And he said, I'm going to take it upon myself to make it work. I'm going to be a really mean guard. I'm going to, I'm going to be like Rod Steiger in Heat of the Night. So he, he's going to be a, 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 movie, a movie guy. The prisoners called him John Wayne because he was like a Wild West cowboy. And here's what he says, and here's the ultimate dehumanization. He said, we, me and the other guards, thought of the prisoners as our puppets. And we were their puppeteers. But let's hear in his own voice. I decided that I would become the worst, most uh, intimidating, uh, cruel prison guard that I could possibly be. At the time, if you had questioned me about the effect I was having, I would say, well, you know, they must be, they must be a wimp. They're weak or they're faking because I wouldn't have believed that what I was doing could actually cause somebody to have a nervous breakdown. It was just us sort of getting our jollies with it. You know, let's, let's be like puppeteers here. Let's make these people do things. Let's, we're getting our jollies off. Let's be like puppeteers. Let's make these people do things. He knows these people are other students. He knows by a flip of the coin, he could be wearing the smock and they could be wearing the uniform. But within two days, that memory is gone. He is powerful and they are uh, insignificant. So again, the dramatic parallels between the Stanford Prison Study and Abu Ghraib. So in 2004, American soldiers in, in a prison in, in Iraq, we saw images of them doing exactly the same thing as our guards did, putting bags over their heads, stripping them naked, sexually abusing them. Uh, and it was one of the major um, uh, disasters for American foreign policy, because this was shown throughout the Middle East. This is what Americans are like. Uh, and so I became an expert witness for one of the guards, Chip Frederick. All the abuses happened only on the night shift, none on the day shift. So that's a situational variable. 
And the reason was that the head of military intelligence went to the head of military police and says, we're not getting any information about who's, uh, uh, who's planting these improvised explosive devices. And so we want your guards on the night shift to take the gloves off. We want, you to do, want them to do whatever they have to do so that when we interrogate prisoners, they give us actionable intelligence. And in three months, not a single senior officer went down to the dungeon at night. So you give them you know, total freedom to do whatever they want. And what happened is that they did the really terrible things, but it was the start of digital uh, uh, cameras. So they took pictures of all the stuff they were doing, and they actually put them on a, on a CD uh, and passed them around. Uh, and it got worse and worse, and it wasn't until one of the guards, Joe Darby, was revolted by this, and he took one of these CDs and he gave it to a senior officer and said, sir, what, what my buddies are doing is, is reprehensible, that you should investigate. And, of course, they had to do it. And, and he knew that, that he would be in trouble. In fact, they had to put him, his mother, and his wife in protective custody for three years until all the trials were over. The Bush administration, of course, said, and military, these are the work of a few bad apples. Don't blame the military. We're really good. My hypothesis was our soldiers were good. Somebody, like the military, put them in that really bad apple. There were many reports about what happened in Abu Ghraib, I, really a dozen, that I, I read all of them. And one of them was by John Schlesinger. Most of them were by generals. And he says, psychologists have attempted to understand how and why individuals and groups who usually act humanely can sometimes act otherwise in certain circumstances. That's what I call the looser effect. And then he says, the landmark Stanford study provides a cautionary tale for a military detention operation. They knew about my study. They knew about it if you give un unlimited power to the guards, especially as we did on the night shift, because I was sleeping at, sometimes at night, that that's, that's a recipe for disaster. There's a wonderful cartoon that summarizes everything we've said. There's two off-duty cops, and one says, you know, I'm neither a good cop nor a bad cop, Jerome. Like yourself, I'm a complex amalgam of positive and negative personality traits that emerge or not depending on the circumstances. So that's a situational um, uh, defense. Now, the interesting thing is some of you may know that last year there was a movie called The Stanford Prison Experiment, a Hollywood movie. Uh, it premiered at Sundance. It's won many awards. It's about 90% accurate. I was a consultant on the movie, and it's very, very powerful. In fact, the last 10 minutes are uh, all the things in the last 10 minutes actually happen, but it's, it's, um, it's as upsetting as, as anything I've ever seen in the movie. So I'm going to just show you the trailer. Would you rather be a guard or a prisoner? I don't think I have the qualities to be a guard. Prisoner. Prisoner, I guess. Prisoner. Sounds like it would be a little less work. Prisoner. What's that? Nobody likes guards. <laughs> Good afternoon, gentlemen. This experiment will be an extension of my research into the effects prisons can have on human behavior. You're going to be pleased to know that you all have been chosen to be the prison guards. But under no circumstances whatsoever are you to physically assault the prisoners in any way. So remember, just as you were watching the prisoners, my graduate staff and I will be watching you. All right, gentlemen, we're going to have ourselves a lot of fun. Rule number one, prisoners must remain silent. This is an exercise period. Okay, is it just me, or are these guys taking this thing a bit too seriously? Why don't you give me 20 push-ups? <laughs> Look at this guy. He thinks he's John Wayne or something. You address me as Mr. Correctional Officer. This might be an interesting two weeks after all. Why don't you make up your bunk, 8612? I did, Mr. Correctional Officer. Well, that's not what I see. Hey, what are you doing here? Just make that! What was that? You just hit him. You're not supposed to hit him. Should we step in? No. Let the guards figure it out. Let's see where it goes. Good evening, gentlemen. How about we make this one a night to remember? This is all real. They won't let you go. 
They won't let us leave. Those are not prisoners. Those are not subjects. Those are boys, and you are harming them. Okay, so, so quickly now, um, put that in the past. So what I want to do quickly is to take you through what happened after the study. I wrote a few, for me it was a, a, a nice demonstration of the power of situations. And I put it, to, I wrote a few articles, I put it to sleep. And what happened was I began to study two things, shyness and time per perception. I, I, in talking to my introductory psych class after, I said, how many of you plan to be prisoners? How many of you plan to be guards? Why should you care about this study? I said, think of the metaphor, of what it means to be a prisoner, what it means to be a guard. Think about shyness as a self-imposed psychological prison. If shy, when you're shy, nobody says you are a shy person. You say, I'm shy, and therefore, here's all the things I can't do. So shy people, are their own prisoner and their own guard. And I realized at that time in 1972, no one had studied shyness in adolescents or adults. So we set up a shyness research center at Stanford. We started studying shyness, and we discovered many interesting things about it. And then we created a shyness clinic um, uh, uh, at Stanford. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, before I get to that. So, so I did write later on, this is in the wrong place, uh, my Lucifer Effect book uh, in 2008, uh, that the human mind has infinite capacity to make any of us kind or cruel, caring or indifferent, creative or destructive, and pushes some of us to villains, and the good news, I would say at the end of my talk, pushes some of us to be heroes. Um, and then I, the shyness research and treatment, um, so I conceptualize shyness as self-imposed psychological prison, which the shy individual is both prison and guard, who limits his, his or her own freedom of speech, association, action. Um, uh, when we started studying shyness in the 1970s, what we discovered was 40% of all people we interviewed, we interviewed thousands, said, I think of myself as a shy person. It's dispositional. It's in me. 40% said, I used to be shy, I've outgrown it. 15%, I'm situationally shy. Blind dates, when my mother makes me perform for relatives, etc. If you add up the numbers, only 5% are not shy. So not to be shy is the rule, is the exception. And then we followed this up over and over, and the amount of shyness is increasing steadily from the 1970s to now. Uh, Two-thirds of people who said they're currently shy said shyness was a personal problem. Uh, they, they wish they weren't, and they didn't believe there's anything they could do about it. Uh, so I was interviewed by Matt Lauer, uh, while he still had hair, back on the Today Show, uh, about shyness. And uh, curiously, this is, this is one of the best interviews I did. It was like on the spot. So there are different theories about how and why people become shy. Most everyone agrees that life for the shy can be marked by inner turmoil, missed opportunities, and crippling self-doubt. Girls. Boys. Women. Women always made me shy. Young and old, men and women, people of all races and cultures, record numbers of people say they're shy. Some may seem shy on the outside, while others are shy on the inside. Whatever the case, there's often a high price to pay. You're, you're not as social, you can't be meeting as many people as you would like. I think it's all part of being accepted. They're afraid they won't be accepted for whatever reason. There's some people that are painfully shy, and in a social situation, it, you can feel their discomfort. Psychology professor Philip Zimbardo of Stanford University is one of the nation's foremost authorities on shyness and what can be done to overcome it. Professor Zimbardo, good morning. Good morning. Give me the thumbnail definition. What exactly is shyness in your terms? Well, shyness is metaphorically a shrinking back from life. Psychologically, uh, it's a fear of being ridiculed, rejected, found unworthy of love by other people. Behaviorally, it ranges from just an awkwardness around other people all the way to isolation from other people. And socially, it strains the bonds of the human connection. When scientists study this, do they tend to think that this comes from genetics, they're born this way, or the environment plays a huge role? The simple answer is it's both. 
uh, research uh, by Jerry Kagan at Harvard indicates about 15% of all babies are born with a push toward nature to be shy, and an equal number are born being outgoing and bold. But the figures on shyness range from 40 to 50%. So that means environment is giving a push further in that direction. And it can be anything from rejection at an early age to failures at an early age, the way your parents treat you, things like that? Yeah, well, culture plays a role. So, so we know in some societies, uh, Asian societies are more shy. Uh, we found in Israel, uh, shyness is much lower. Uh, the way you're treated, failure experiences, uh, often seeing other people ridicule, rejected, uh, is enough to turn this shyness trigger. You talk about a couple of different categories in terms of shy people. You talk about mm -hmm. the publicly shy, which we've all seen. We know right. what they're like. Mm -hmm. You also talk about shy extroverts. What are they? Well, we've been studying shyness since 1972. Uh, we were the first really to focus on shyness in adults. And one of the categories that was remarkable to us are these shy extroverts. These are people who have learned the social language of interaction. They know how to tell a story, how to have a conversation, how to look comfortable with people. And in fact, the inner self is this terribly shy private person. Most stand-up comedians, a lot of talk show hosts, a lot of politicians, people you would never think of as shy, but are these shy extroverts. Now, what's unique about them is that they can do their number, they can fool the world only under one circumstance, when they're in their power domain, when everything is scripted, and, and they are in control. But you put them in a situation of intimacy, put them in, in a spontaneous situation... And they're lost. And lost. If 50% of the people out there say they're shy, <clears throat> let's help them, okay? Right. What can those people who may be looking <clears throat> at the TV set right now going, man, that's me, what can they do to overcome it? Well, there's a lot of things to do. If your shyness is really extreme, and it can, it can really mean that you almost never leave the house, almost bordering on what we call agoraphobia, mm -hmm. then really you should get uh, some psychological help, counseling. Uh, uh, we prefer uh, group therapy because shyness is a social phenomenon, so you learn to deal with people in groups, and using a technique called cognitive behavior modification. Very pragmatic. So you don't focus on where does shyness come from, but <clears throat> what is it doing to you, and how do you change that? Uh, if it's more moderate, you can use... My book, Shyness, What It Is, What To Do About It, because it has exercises we developed. Give me a couple of those exercises shyness real clinic. quickly. Well, first of all, shyness, shyness, to overcome shyness, you have to take social risks. So that means that, that you have to um, say hello to people, make eye contact, smile, have an open posture rather than a closed posture. That shy people give off a body language which, which makes other people feel awkward in their presence. You have to practice social communication, meaning talking to people. So when you're waiting online in a supermarket, when make you small talk. learn to make small talk, which is something that's dying. Learn to give compliments. Learn to receive compliments. We usually say you don't have to suffer in silence. In this case, you don't have to suffer in shyness. Dr. Right. Zimbardo, Professor Zimbardo, we thank you very much. You're welcome. Up next, a powerlifting grandma. Right after this. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so we created a shyness clinic at Stanford mostly for students and our therapists with students and then we moved it out in the community and our clinic now is still operating in Palo Alto in the Palo Alto University. It's the only clinic in the world that focuses only on shyness and shy people. Other clinics work on social phobia, social anxiety and we have a hundred percent success because we can identify for each person where their shyness is coming from and we can target treatment exactly for, for those people. Uh, now, there's a new way of treating shyness, which is uh, uh, somewhat controversial, uh, that I'd like you to consider. Do you have feelings of inadequacy? Louder. Do you suffer from shyness? Do you sometimes wish you were more assertive? If you answered yes to any of these questions, ask your doctor or pharmacist about tequila. Tequila, tequila is the safe, natural way to feel better and more confident about yourself and your actions. Tequila can help ease you out of your shyness and let you tell the world that you're ready and willing to do just about anything. You'll notice the benefits of tequila almost immediately. And with a regimen of regular 
smaller doses, you can overcome any obstacles that prevent you from living the life you want to live. Shyness and awkwardness will be a thing of the past, and you'll discover many talents you never knew you had. Stop hiding and start living with tequila. Tequila may not be right for everyone. Women who are pregnant or nursing should not use tequila. However, women who wouldn't mind nursing or becoming pregnant are encouraged to try it. Side effects may include dizziness, nausea, vomiting, incarceration, erotic lustfulness, loss of motor control, loss of clothing, loss of money, loss of virginity, delusions of grandeur, table dancing, headache, dehydration, dry mouth, and a desire to sing karaoke and play all night rounds of strip poker, truth or dare, and naked twister. Warning, the consumption of alcohol may make you think you're whispering when you're not, is a major factor in dancing like a retard, may cause you to tell your friends over and over again that you're in love with them, also may cause you to think you can sing. Alcohol may lead you to believe that ex-lovers are really dying for you to telephone them at four in the morning. Alcohol may make you think you can logically converse with members of the opposite sex without spitting. It may create the illusion that you are tougher, smarter, faster, and better looking than most people, and it may lead you to think people are laughing with you. Alcohol may cause pregnancy, and it also may be a major factor in getting your ass kicked. So what are you waiting for? Stop hiding and start living with tequila. Tequila! Okay. Um, so why is shyness increasing? Um, uh, it's now the tech revolution. We are not practicing or learning basic social skills. Uh, we are living with our cell phone in one hand, and we're going to see in a moment, young men especially are living, uh, playing video games. Um, so in the past, shyness was not knowing how to navigate the social landscape, not knowing how to ask for directions, for example, fear rejection. New shyness is being unwilling to ask for directions, not wanting to connect, not wanting to connect with people. Many young people are now preferring to live in what we call in virtual reality. Uh, so I wrote a book recently um, with my co-author, Nikki uh, Colomb, called Man Interrupted, Why Young Men Are Struggling and What We Can Do About It. Uh, so uh, we examine the problem looking at individual factors, situational factors, systemic factors, which we don't have time to go into. Uh, but the bottom line is uh, uh, video games are now a multi-billion dollar industry. Video games are now fascinating. They're compelling. Uh, and boys now get addicted, meaning they play 5 to 15 hours a day or a night every day. And now the, the break, you play a few, 5 or 6 hours. The break is you watch online pornography. So it's like a double addiction to porn and gaming. Uh, and it turns out another problem is, so kids are doing badly. If you're playing video games that much, what are you not doing? You're not doing your homework, you're not exercising, you're becoming obese, uh, you're not doing anything creative, you're not reading, you're not writing, you're not learning, uh, you're learning foreign languages, uh, you quit your job, you, you stop uh, being with your friends. Uh, and then the other problem is, so they're doing badly in school. Uh, we have lots of data, uh, boys doing much worse than girls. And the other thing is girls are doing better. So when guys are on the demise, women are on the rise. And so boys can no longer compete with girls academically anywhere. Uh, but so they come home with a poor grade. Mothers give love unconditionally. Mothers say, try harder. Mama loves you anyway. Fathers give love conditionally. They say, it's not enough. Step up to the plate. I'm going to cut your allowance, et cetera, et cetera. The problem now in America, 41% of all boys are growing up without a father. So they lose that extrinsic motivation to do better. Their mother is still saying, I love you. It's OK. You're going to stay in your room. You're not in trouble. You're not out on the street. Uh, and so this is a big problem. It, so it's 25% in the UK, but the divorce rate where, um, uh, in most cases, mothers get custody is, is 41% and growing in America. In addition to personal family, our system puts up roadblocks for boys and young men. What does it mean to be a guy? Movies, television, all make guys klutzes. Uh, there's almost no movie which, which re respects manhood. And also, it's not clear anymore what it means to be a man, what it means to be, uh, uh, to be in charge. And again, the sex, uh, gender roles are changing. So young men are, have no clear image of what they should be, what they should be like. Um, uh, boys are getting less educated than their fathers for the first time. Boys are more likely to drop out of school to be put in special ed to repeat a grade. They get 70% of all Ds and Fs. They're two, two to three times more likely to be diagnosed with attention deficit disorder. Boys are a year to a year and a half behind girls in school. And boys are only two of five now university students. Here's an interesting graph how this operates around the world. This was from The Economist. So this is 15-year-old boys and girls who are low achievers in all subjects. This is at, uh, in uh, 2012. So in Indonesia, Brazil, 
So the blue line is boys and the red line is girls. So you see the gap. Boys are doing worse than girls in virtually every country except in China, because in China, uh, aside from the smoking, parents put enormous pressure, the same on girls and boys, to succeed in school. They go, they go to after school programs, they go to Saturday programs, and so they wipe out the difference. But in every other country, uh, or the average is boys on the average do worse than girls in math, science, and reading. Um, so in our book, we have lots of uh, solutions. I don't have time to go through all of them. But a part of it, again, is developing a future orientation. The other thing, if you live in video games, you live in the moment. Okay? And, and again, what, what we're arguing, I'll, I'll show in a minute, the importance of time perspective, developing a future orientation. Plan now for, for the future. Um, so understanding one's time perspective can help with time management and awareness of how you allocate your time. So I wrote a book called The Time Paradox, uh, in which it says the paradox is the most important thing in your life that influences all of your decisions is something you don't know about. Inside of you, you have a time machine. You live in the past or present or future, and you live, each of those uh, are uh, compartmentalized. For some people, they, have a, they live in the past negative, meaning you remember only the bad old times. Other people live in the past positive, you remember all the good times. You can be present-oriented, but present fatalistic. It says, it doesn't pay to plan. Nothing ever works out for me. Or present hedonistic. You live, you live for the moment. You live for sensation. You live for novelty. And you can be future-oriented, meaning most of us are here. What education does is encourage you to be future-oriented. You plan for the future. When you make a decision, uh, uh, you, follow, you follow through on it. Uh, and also you can be, but it can be negative. You can be worried about the future. You can be anxious about it. Uh, so, so time perspective is the study of how individuals divide the flow of their experience into different time frames or time zones. You do it automatically and unconsciously. The problem is they vary between cultures, vary in geography. So people who live close to the equator are almost all present-oriented. If you live in an environment where the, the climate doesn't change, you focus on sameness rather than differentness, rather than change. Um, so again, as I said, you could be focused on the past, on positive and negatives. You can be focused on the present, hedonism, fatalism. You can be focused on the future, focused on life goals. But also for some people, we call it transcendental future. So, uh, so for, in some religions, you live your life so that when you die, you're going to go to heaven rather than someplace else. And we have scales that measure all of these in, very precisely. So again, if you go online, the time paradox, I think it's .com, you can take our scale and give you your scores and compare it to what we think is, is ideal. So finally, we want to inspire all youth to become everyday heroes. So when I talk to high school kids, they say, who's your hero? And everyone has, has a superhero. And I say, you know what? Every superhero envies you. You know why? You have something none of them have. What do you think it is? You have a brain. None of them are brain. They are the creation of the brains of cartoonists. So in fact, they can fly, they can, in, in, in the imagination of the, of the uh, cartoonists, you can do things with your brain if you use it that they never thought about. So the message is, use your brain wisely and well, obviously. So what is a hero? A hero is somebody who acts to help others in need or to defend a moral cause. And you do it to be a real hero, you're aware of risk. There's risk to life and limb. Heroes are usually modest, when, when somebody does a heroic deed and you say, you know, you'll see in a moment, when somebody does a heroic deed and you say, wow, that was really heroic. They're, no, no, I did what anyone could do. I did what anyone should do. Um, so my new conception of heroes, we want to democratize, demystify, diffuse it. Anyone can be a hero. So again, we have this old notion of noble heroes, military heroes, Agamemnon, Achilles, samurai warriors, usually male warrior killers. Say, no, 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 anyone can be a hero. You don't need any special qualities. Uh, and we want to move away from solo heroes to heroes in squads. And we're going to give you a wonderful example of a woman in Poland who organized a squad of 20, 19 other women and one man who saved uh, uh, thousands of Jewish children uh, from sure death. Uh, at the core of heroism is a sense of moral courage. It's not bravery. Bravery really is for first responders, military. We're really talking about moral courage. Um, 
So we need heroes because they shift the norm from passive compliance to pro-social action. Heroes put their best self forward in service to all of humanity. They represent ideals we can all aspire to. So heroes are the force of good that opposes evil in its many forms. As I said earlier, evil of action and the evil of inaction. You know, uh, what's remarkable about uh, history is uh, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Uh, you know, last year Rosa Parks passed away. Uh, and you know, I, I remember sitting on this stage with world leaders and Bill Clinton and senators and governors and, and thinking uh, we were all paying homage to a seamstress uh, who had transformed the country and, and helped transform the world. Uh, you know, we, we never know sort of how our actions are going to ripple uh, over time. Uh, but each of us can take some responsibility for making sure that uh, we are pushing a little bit in the direction of justice and in the direction of equality and in the direction of tolerance. And uh, when we do that, uh, uh, we may surprise ourselves with the amount of influence that in fact we have just by standing up or speaking up. Again, it's the ripple effect from the Milgram study, the positive and negative. And again, he's saying, by standing up and speaking out, we each of us have an enormous amount of power to be able to do that and have, have an influence. It's also sad to think that we've lost that articulate president uh, for the uh, newer one. Uh, so this is Rosa Parks. Some of you may not know her, some of the younger people. She was a seamstress, meaning uh, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in Georgia, she, fixed, she uh, sewed dresses for rich white ladies. And one day uh, in the South, uh, uh, all, all transportation was segregated. There was a colored section and a white section. One day she refused to sit in the colored section. Uh, and she said, I paid the same as money as any, I sit wherever I want. They put her in jail. Here she is as prisoner, 7053. But that triggered uh, the civil rights movement that ultimately her simple action changed the law of, of uh, segregated transportation in the United States. Now here's Irina Sedlich. This is one of my favorite heroes, uh, a Polish hero. Uh, in 1943, the Nazis put all Jews uh, uh, around Warsaw into a ghetto. They built a 10-foot wall. And they put 40,000 or more Jews into this place with a starvation diet of 250 calories a day. P potato, uh, something and something else. Uh, knowing that the children, old people would die, and whoever survived, they would send to concentration camps. She heard about this from a friend and went to see for herself. And she realized this was a death, this was a death camp within, within Warsaw uh, in Poland. And so she went to talk to the head rabbi and said, we want to help children uh, survive. We want to help smuggle them out. Uh, and he spoke to the parents, and they said, no, they couldn't imagine that this is going to go on forever. And finally, she convinced them. And she organized a network, a hero network, of 20 other people to smuggle children out. They found an underground sewer, uh, and they worked for a whole year, and they saved 2,500 children. So here's, they couldn't do it alone, so here's this hero network, this hero squad. And what she did for each of these people, she said, I will put the information about your family in a note in a jar and hide it in her yard. And there's a new book called Life in a Jar, about what she did. I think there's going to be a movie about it. Now, 50 years later, those 2,500 kids have had children and grandchildren. So more than 10,000 people owe their life to this woman, Irina Sendler. The good news is um, she was recognized by uh, Yad Vashem uh, as, a as righteous among the Gentiles uh, when she was much older, like when she was in, uh, maybe in her 90s. So she got the hero status late in life. Um, uh, and so this is a powerful ripple effect. Whoops, I'm sorry, I keep doing that. OK, now, heroes come in all sizes and shapes. This is a little kid also from that Sichuan province where that primary school is, that there was, there was an earthquake. And because of shoddy construction, the ceilings on all, many of the schools fell down, cr crashed, and killed many of the children. He happened to be near the door. He ran out. As he's running away, he hears his friends yelling. He goes back, risks his life, and saves, saves uh, several kids. People said, why did you do that? He said, I was the hall monitor. It was my job to look after my classmates. So that's the heroic imagination put into action. Um, now, here's, 
Here's what I call a reactive impulsive hero. So whistleblowers are proactive, that uh, you see something wrong, there's corruption, injustice, and you collect information, you get other people, uh, uh, and you're gonna expose this. There are other heroes like him who see something and something in them, they respond immediately. Uh, they risk their life. In his case, they risk his life incredibly. So Wesley Autry is called the New York subway superhero. He was standing on a platform in New York by City College, I think it's 137th Street uh, in Manhattan, and there's 75 people on the platform, and he sees this guy walk to the end, stumble, and fall down across the tracks. If you live in New York, you know every three minutes a subway train comes in. It's going to cut this guy in thirds. He looks around, and everybody freezes. The bystander effect. Nobody does anything. He's got two little girls with him. He turns to a stranger and says, take care of my kids. He jumps down on the platform, goes, goes pick the guy up, puts him between the tracks, uh, so when the train comes over them, it doesn't uh, kill him. Afterwards, he says, I did what anyone could do, but I did what everyone ought to do. Let's look at a hero in action. On the New York City subway, it's hard enough finding someone who will give up his seat to a stranger, let alone be willing to give up his life for one. The train was coming in like, like, like that. And it happened just... 50-year-old Wesley Autry, a construction worker and Navy veteran, was standing on a subway platform with his two little girls, when right in front of them, a man started having a seizure. He kind of stumbled and over his own feet and fall backwards. I see a train coming, but the train is so close, I'm like, what do I do? Wesley jumped onto the tracks and thought if he could just lie on top of the man, keep him from flailing, maybe the train would roll right over both of them. The clearance was exactly 21 inches. Wesley and the man... 20 and a half. No way the train can stop before this gentleman could get him, get him up off the tracks. So he covered him with his body and pushed him down to a point where the train wouldn't hit his head and held him down under the tracks while the train came and rolled right over the top of him. It gave Wesley's children the scare of their young lives. I thought he was going to get killed. And Wesley, the scare of his too. I'm like talking to him, sir, you can't move. I got two kids up here looking for the father to come back. I don't know you, you don't know me, but listen, don't panic. You know, I'm here to save you. As for the guy Wesley saved, he's 20-year-old Cameron Hollipter. And other than a few scrapes and bruises, his father says he's doing fine. Mr. Autry's instinctive and unselfish act saved our son's life. You know, the word hero gets thrown around a lot nowadays. What a better way to say to start off the new year than to save, save a life. <laughs> nice to be reminded of what one really looks like. Steve Hartman, CBS News, New York. So the other hero, the woman who stopped the prison study, and it's really not in the movie, was a woman named Christina Maslach. She had been my graduate student at Stanford, PhD, and she had just gotten a job at Berkeley and we just decided to move in together. We're gonna to try to see if, if it works out. If so, then we'll get married. And actually in the movie, you see us moving in together. So here's her account of what happened. Fifth day of the study, Zimbardo invited his girlfriend, a recent psychology graduate, Christina Maslach, to visit the mock prison. I had heard bits and pieces uh, from Phil uh, about what was going on. And then when I was down there that evening, it really was kind of a wow. The thing that really got to me was when some of the guards took the prisoners down the hall to the men's room. She looks out and sees a line of the prisoners with paper bags over their heads, each one holding the other one's shoulder. And they're leading them down the hall. And Phil comes over and I, look, look, you know, my God, look at that. And I looked up and something about it just, you know, again, it was the dehumanizing, demeaning kind of treatment. I just, I couldn't watch it. And she said, it's terrible what you're doing to those boys. And she got tears in her eyes. I said, what? And she runs out. And I'm, and I'm furious. I'm saying, you know, I'm saying, look, this is, you know, I run outside. We had this big argument. I'm saying, look, this is, this is dynamics of human behavior. Look, it's fascinating, the power of the situation. All the, so I'm giving her all the psychological basis. And what kind of psychologist are you? You don't appreciate this. Um, and she said, I don't understand. You're a stranger to me. I don't understand this. How could you not 
see what I see. I mean, you know, you're a caring, compassionate person. I know you from all these other things. Something's gone wrong here. And then the next thing she said, which had an equally big impact, is, uh, you know, I'm not sure I want to, you know, have anything to do with you if this is the real you. And that was like a slap in the face because what she was saying is, you've changed. You know, the power of the situation has transformed you from, from the person I thought I knew to this person that I don't know. And at that moment, I said, wow, you're right. We got to end it. After only six days, Dr. Zimbardo shut down his experiment. The question is, what was I going to do with this heroic challenge? We were married the next year at Stanford. We have two kids, and we just had our 44th anniversary. So since then, I've given up no more dining in hell. I'm only going to promote goodness and heroism in my new life. And I'm going to go very quickly now. I know we're running very late. Um, so I created in 2008 something called the Heroic Imagination Project in San Francisco. It's a nonprofit. We believe that heroism starts in the imagination, thinking I could be. Uh, and then uh, we, we teach people how to stand up, speak out, and change the world. Our approach is based on the premise that it's ordinary people are capable of taking extraordinary action. Just as Obama said earlier, uh, we have educational programs mostly in high school and college. We want to, we want to work with uh, teachers in, in middle school and primary school, as well as in corporations to develop corporate leadership. We've developed six programs, all based on social psychology. And today, we did an exciting training uh, with uh, uh, many of the staff here by the bystander effect. Uh, we also use Carol Dweck's work on mindset. How do you transform people who have a narrow, static mind, a fixed mindset to a growth mindset? And then the other, the other program we do, uh, we've developed in, in great detail is transforming prejudice and, and discrimination into understanding and acceptance. Uh, in each program, we have the same eight questions. So once a teacher learns one of these, it, it works throughout. The other thing that's revolutionary, we have, it's all videos, provocative videos. Uh, and it's give and take. So teachers don't lecture anymore. You give them a script, and, it, and we give them all the scientific evidence on which all of our conclusions are based. Um, and so the question is, what can you do? Uh, when one person stops to help in an emergency, others join in. So the power of one, be that person. The power of be an ally to other people who are in need, people who are being discriminated against, people who are being bullied. The power of many, create hero squads like Arena Sendler. Dare to be different. Practice being a positive deviant. I, that's an exercise I have in my class. Uh, act, soci act socially. Be sociocentric, not egocentric. Egocentrism is the enemy of heroism. If you're thinking about me, you're never thinking about we or us. So practice being a positive deviant for a day. I give my, my class an exercise. Put a magic, with a racial magic marker. Put a square on your forehead. You don't see it. People get crazy. They say, what is that? You say, it's a square. They say, take it off. No, forget it. Don't notice. People put, will put pressure on you. And if you could resist for one day, not going like this, suddenly you realize how much of what you are is influenced by what people want you to be. And so, so it really is a simple exercise, but it's really a very uh, dynamic one. So start with small steps. Focus on, in every situation, focus on others. Make people feel special in some way. Make eye contact. Ask their name. Remember their name. Give a justifiable compliment. Ask questions, challenge the rules. When somebody says that's the rule, you say, who made it? Why do I, what would happen if I don't follow it? Don't blindly obey authority. Practice mindful disobedience. And again, as Obama says, think of your ripple effect. Think of what you do is going to have an influence, whether, whether you know it or not. Me becomes we, I becomes us. I want you to be my hero after all of this. So the decision to act heroically is a choice that many of us will be called upon to make at some point in time in the future. How can we create a new heroic vision in which silence, apathy, and indifference is never an option? We showed a film today in, in, in our training, and as you saw with Wesley Autry, uh, the interesting thing, we did a national survey, probability survey, and it turned out that African-American men and women are twice as likely to help in an emergency as Caucasians are. And this is something that we have to follow up to find out why, but here's a powerful subject for research that I hope some of you will take up. Uh, so the world needs more heroes. Yoda says, do or do not, there is no try. So what will you do? We call it everyday heroes. So to be a hero in training means that you are each day doing daily deeds of kindness and compassion that are not heroism of themselves, 
but it's on the path to heroism. So when something big happens, like the Sichuan crash, like somebody drowning, like somebody hurt, somebody in an accident, it's simply more likely that you will step up and make a difference. So let's work together to create a new generation of heroes in your school, here, in your community, and really around the world. In America, our program is really only in the Western United States, California, Arizona, Oregon, but it's around the world. I literally go around the world and I do training as I did here. And our program is say, all over Hungary, 1,600 schools, all over Poland, in Sicily, where my, my family comes from, in Portugal, and now even in Iraq. And we're about to start a pro in, 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 in Iran, not Iraq, Iran. Uh, we, it's, we're in Bali, we're in Geelong, Australia, and we're about to have a big program in, in China. So this is really exciting for me as, as this little idea we had is spreading around the world. So we'd like you to visit us online, heroicimagination.org. We're a 501c3. You can, you can contribute if you like. And later on, if you want, uh, we are selling uh, photos of me, sign, and, and um, uh, poster, and uh, for 5 or $10, and all the money goes to Heroic Imagination Project. So today I have explained uh, my own process and lifelong journey, trying to understand the nature of human nature. I've explained a variety of different topics that help illuminate what I think of as the human condition. Shyness, time perspective, evil, heroism, and I should put in, and prejudice. Please visit the following sites, heroicimagination.org, shyness.com, prisonexperiment.org. And with that, I thank you so much for your attention. Uh, Professor Diana Savas. Yes. Uh, who has also done uh, Holocaust research. Uh, and I was just wondering if the results of the Stanford Prison Experiment and the Situational Evil Experiments have been used as defenses in trials of individual guards and genocide trials, especially uh, in the context of state-sponsored genocide? Yes, that's a really good question. Um, uh, I think in some, in some cases, oh yeah, okay. In some cases, uh, where guards say, you know, I was just doing my job. Um, that's many of the guards in, in the Nazi concentration camp simply said, I was just doing my job. Well, it turns out that's not an adequate defense because there were many guards in concentration camps who did not do that, who did not abuse prisoners, in many cases did little deeds of kindness and caring for prisoners. Uh, and we have, we have many instances of that. Thank you. Yes, Hi. you are? Uh, my name is Esmeralda. And what year are you in? If you're, uh, if you're a student, say what year. This is my first year. What? This is my first year. Oh, great. Um, we met earlier today. I just first want to clarify. Yes. We met earlier today, and you asked me where I was from. Yes. I said Pasadena. Yes. But <laughs> I think you meant country, so yes. I just want to clarify it's Mexico. Yes. Okay. And then my question is, um, with your experiments, how do, you, how do you come to a conclusion about what you want to experiment? How do I come? Oh, sorry. Um, come to a conclusion with what you want to experiment with. Oh, I'm interested, I'm interested in, in human nature. So um, I'm considered eclectic, meaning I study many different things. Uh, I have actually published in 40 different areas of psychology. Beside all of this, many other kinds of things. Um, I just get, I'm interested in lots of stuff. And when I get interested, I say, how can we study this? And as a researcher, I, I always think about either experiments or correlational studies or interview studies. So I, I always carry curiosity into action. That's, that's my, my orientation. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Hi, you are. Professor. Uh, my name is Valina. I'm currently a high school student. And uh, I'm, Thank chi you for I'm, I'm from China. So um, I think two weeks ago, like President Trump just, uh, that he had the travel ban. And I talk about this with my teacher at school, and I noticed that most of my Asian teachers, they avoid to talk about this topic. Yeah. And, but most of my uh, like white teachers, they talk about this topic with great passion. Right. So I kind of want to know why. Is that a social norm in Asia that control people not to speak about social topics? Because both of them told me that this is not the topics that we should worry about. And later on when I went online, I noticed that Asian, especially for Asians, we have a so social norm that, oh, this is government's business. We are not supposed to talk about that. You are like, you might be able to get into trouble if you talk about that. 
So do you think that's an evil or like why do you think we have this kind of social norm in our culture? No, I don't think it's evil, but there, is, there are social norms which say, here's the social norm, this is what you can do, this is what you should not do. Uh, so again, um, in, many, in many Asian countries, um, there really is, is a limit on individuals taking action. So that's when I say, this thing about ch smoking, you know, I'm saying, you know, what can Asian, what can Chinese students do about this? Well, you can't do anything alone, but if you form a group, so I'm saying, so I want, I want to get people uh, who cannot risk taking action alone to say, we're going to do this together. So right now, uh, Trump has not said we're going to discriminate against Asians, but there's no reason why he, he can't in the future. Uh, so, so essentially, I think everyone has to stand up for what they believe in. But as I'm saying, you're more, almost always more effective if you do it in a group, if you do it in a hero squad than alone. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Professor. Um, my name is Angela, and I'm a high school student also. Great. Thank you for coming. Um, my question is, um, so obviously your um, Stanford prison experiment was cut short. Do you regret um, conducting the experiment, or do you feel like the results um, outweighed the consequences? Yeah, uh, I don't regret doing it. I mean, the interesting thing is almost 50 years later, it's the most talked about experiment, movie done, that it, it's, it's, it's lessons are really profound. Um, I probably should have ended it earlier. I probably should have ended it when the second prisoner broke down. What I have not said is we spent a whole day at the end of the study in psychological debriefing, meaning I met with all the prisoners for two hours, then all the guards for two hours, and the prisoners and the guards together to get them to cathart, to, to get say what they feel, who was angry, who felt guilty. And then I brought them all back two weeks later, because in those days it took two weeks to develop the videos, to develop the slides. And for some of them, I've been in touch with them for many, many, many years. Um, and so there's no, there's no sign of any negative lasting effect. See, one of the things that's unique about the study is when it ended, you were like an actor on a stage. What happens if you're on a stage? You take off your costume, you hang it up. Uh, you, take, you go off the stage, you go back. So the, the prison setting was a stage, and they were all in costume. So at the end of the study, we took off the costumes, we took you out of the basement, we put you back into your real life. In Milgram's study, people felt guilt because they came in the way they are and they left the way they are. It was the same you, you and then you who, who, uh, who thought what you were uh, torturing somebody else. Uh, and so because each prisoner and each guard was able to, to disidentify with the role they played, we, we have no evidence of any negative lasting effect. Thank you. Hello, you are? Hi, Dr. Zimbardo. I'm Jennifer Noble. I teach here psychology. I just wanted to let you know, in the fall semester, I took some students to um, study abroad in Italy. And a group of us went down to Sicily and were able to um, visit Clelia Bartoli and get some training wow. with your hip program. I was hoping, I think a lot of people left. I see, I thought I saw one Natalie, I don't know where she went, but, oh, yeah. <laughs> Some uh, of our students from Italy are here. I was hoping maybe they could all come up and, but yes, they had an that. excellent experience learning about your program. And I only knew about it because I came to your talk last year. Wow. And made, made sure to do it. So I just wanted to make sure I got to tell you that. Yeah, great. So in Sicily, we first had our program in Corleone, the godfather town. And now we have it in the ghetto in Palermo. And many of our students on our program are African students who have migrated there alone without parents. And so many of them are hoping to learn lessons, eventually to go back to bring the lessons we're teaching. And I'm going to go there in June. We're going to have a big ceremony uh, where we're having a contest now. Kids are doing photographs, compositions, artworks, and we're going to give each, each of those students a big, a big prize, a big award. You should, you'll see, they have your picture all over their offices <laughs> with the Superman. And we actually, they put together an activity for us where um, the refugees played uh, the immigration officers, and we got to play refugees wow. and experience what it was like to go through the immigration process. Wow. Very powerful. A lot of oh, students that's were wonderful. I didn't moved. know that. Yeah. yeah, so come up afterwards. We'll take a picture, please. 
Yes, my dear. So I'm Julie Kiotis, and unfortunately, that was the last call. Uh, we have promised to give back the room. Oh. So we want to thank you profusely. 